Hi everyone, Julia Usher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. Welcome back. Today I thought I'd challenge myself with a 3D box because you know I love 3D. And I'm also going to challenge myself with a lot of piping just to give myself a break from the stenciling I've been doing with my new stencil line and to give you a little bit of break from stenciling too. So today we're doing this lavish footed needlepoint box. And by needlepoint I mean that the sides are intricately piped with a grid structure into which I lay other colors of royal icing to create patterns. In this one I've got a very geometric pattern which is relatively easy to do. Here I've got one where I followed an actual needlepoint pattern to create something more representational, a flower up the side. I'm going to be talking a lot in this video about these piping techniques, the do's and don'ts of needlepoint which can be applied both to the box and of course always to flat cookies. This particular project is super versatile because, again, all the techniques can be applied in 2D, not just 3D, and the box can be changed up for the season simply by changing the colors or the motifs on the sides and the needlepoint patterns. So let's talk about what we'll need for this project. It's basically a five cookie project without the feet. So you'll need four cookies with windows in them. This has a teardrop shape. The boxes up here actually have sort of a fish scale shape using a different cutter to create the window and I'll be showing you that process in a bit. You can create any shape window you want. This piece is about four inches across, five and a quarter inches tall, but I'll have all the exact dimensions in the video description in case I mess up anything here. You'll need four of those pieces cut exactly the same way. You'll need a base on which the box will sit. This is about four and three quarters by four and three quarters inches, perfect square. Again, these are the mandatory pieces. This could create a nice little box without any elevation, without any little feet on it like you see here. But if you want to lift it up, which I think creates just a little bit of extra on this project, you'll need some additional cookies. One or two round cookies. These are about three inch rounds to serve as the risers that lift the box. Alternatively, if you don't want to bake more cookies, you can use cardboards and we'll probably use cardboards today because in some ways they give a little more flexibility in terms of height because they're a little bit narrower. I can stack more or less up depending on how tall I want the box. And then you'll also need four feet. These feet cookies are Franken cookies which is a term coined by someone in the cookie business, I don't know who, that means to create a new shape out of existing cookie cutter shapes. I've actually used two cutters and some additional cutting to create these shapes and I'll show that in the next step. So in addition to those cookies, both the mandatory ones and the optional ones, we're going to bring in a little bit of garnish to deck out this box in addition to all of the piping that we'll be doing. There will be some embossed fondant plaques that will go inside the window, something like this. A bunch of little roses that will go up the sides of the box, between the needle point and the upper part of the box. I have a whole other video about rose making, so I'm not going to get into the rose making today, but I will refer you to that. And the th third embellishment we'll be using will be little wafer paper bow loops. And again, I have another video about how to make wafer paper ribbons and flowers, and I'll refer you to that for making of these little bow pieces. That's about all we'll need, plus of course some royal icing for the needlepoint work. So let's get started on how to cut out those unusual shapes, namely the side with the window in it and my franken cookied feet. So all of the pieces we're cutting today are custom shapes, meaning I don't have conventional cutters for them. I'm going to be cutting them with acetate templates. You could use cardboard as well, but I prefer to work with templates that are acetate because they're more easily cleaned. If you were going to do a lot of these boxes, then I would suggest investing in getting cutters made for you. But since I'm only going to do one or two of these showpiece cookies, these templates will work just fine. And I'm going to start by showing you how to cut out one of the sides. Today I'm using this gorgeous rolling pin. I did want to give a nod out to Vermont Rolling Pins for giving me this lovely pin. It's got built-in rolling guides. These are about 3 16 of an inch deep, which is exactly how thick I like to roll my dough, a little bit thinner than the norm, just so that I have nice tight fitting seams. So we're going to give that a try today. So starting with the box sides, just going to roll it to a 3 16 inch thickness, which is easy to do absolutely perfectly with this Vermont rolling pin. And having consistent and even dough is 
really important for these tight fitting projects. The project will just look much more perfect and uniform if the dough thickness is the same to start. For the sides, I like to use a large chef knife. Generally speaking, one up and down cut is going to be cleaner than dragging a smaller knife through the dough. So I'm using it on the sides. However, when I get to the curved part at the top of the piece, I'll use my paring knife because that's the only thing that I'll get around. You just want to make sure that paring knife is completely clean so you get a nice clean cut. The dimensions for the template will be in the video description. I think it's about four by five and a quarter inch tall. Okay, you'll notice I'm doing all of this directly on my silicone baking mat. That's so that I can pick up this piece at the end and put it directly on my baking sheet without distorting it. But first we want to add a window and for that I'm marking off the midpoint of the side so that the window ends up dead center. I also want it to be about three quarters inches from the very top. So I'm going to mark off that as a cutting guide for the window as well. Here I'm using a cookie cutter kingdom scale shape for the window and you'll notice I've removed none of the excess dough from around the box and that's for very good reason because sometimes in the process of cutting the window if you do remove that dough first it can misshape the box form itself. So we don't want to remove any excess dough until after that window is cut. Now we can take it off carefully again so you don't hit the cut piece. I often use my trussing needle to do this to get up edges. And if you have any rough edges by all means, flatten them with the side of your paring knife, pick off any debris, and then the whole mat can be picked up, put on the back side of a baking sheet, and go into the oven. So now we've got a side cut with our little window in the center, measured out consistently with my ruler to make sure that I get the same placement on every single side. We're going to want to do that three more times. And I just want to point out, again, I used a little fish scale cutter from Cookie Cutter Kingdom to create this window here and also on these two boxes here but any shape window will really do. Here I used a teardrop, a slightly bigger teardrop than the one I've got, cutter than I've got here. The key thing is just to leave a little room at the bottom, enough room at the bottom for a needle point pattern that will be exposed and reveal a great looking pattern. So you don't want your window too big. Now, this is ready to go directly into the oven without taking the cookie off the silicone baking mat so we don't distort it put it on the back of a cookie sheet and in it goes. 375, about 8 to 10 minutes my normal baking time. My base too was cut with a custom template. This is pretty straightforward. Just roll the dough out and place the template and cut a square. So I'm not going to show you that. What I am going to show you next is how to create a couple of different types of franken cookied feet. So you have different options for the feet as well. Again, I'm going to roll this to a 3 16th inch thickness using my handy Vermont rolling pin. And I'm using two cutters for this particular foot, a 4 inch long rectangle as well as a plaque cutter that's 4 inches long and all sources for the plaque cutter and also the rectangle in the video description. Doing this all again directly on a silicone baking mat, which is important so that we don't misshape it when we put it into the oven by lifting it. We'll lift directly on the mat. My piece is four inches long. As I said, I'm going to mark the center point so that I, when I make my next cut, it's dead center. I'm going to mark that at the top as well. And then I want to measure down about one centimeter, four tenths of an inch or so, to know where to place the cutter, how high to place the second cutter. Once positioned and completely centered, make your second cut. And then we want to trim off the bottom. I'm going to cut this foot about two centimeters deep, roughly eight tenths of an inch, a little bit under an inch or so. All the dimensions will be in the video description. Now we're ready to remove the excess dough. Again, if you do this too soon, you can distort the piece you're cutting. Of course, we try to get more than one on a, on a cookie sheet, but this is just to show you how I cut this particular piece. I like to bake the small pieces separately from the big sides so that they bake more uniformly. If you bake small things and large things on the same cookie sheet, they'll bake at different rates and that creates a little complication in the baking process. So I've got another option for feet. Of course, the sky's the limit in terms of how you cut the windows in the size of the boxes, how you cut the feet. I just want to show you a couple of options to give you some versatility with this project. Different Franken-cookied foot, 
using two different cutters. These cutters, again, from Cookie Cutter Kingdom, they come as a three cutter set. I'm using, I believe, the biggest and the medium size on that particular set, but I'll have all the dimensions in the video description. So we'll first cut with this and then this to create this fun shape. The process is identical to cutting the other foot. Everything stays on the silicone baking mat and I don't remove any excess dough until it's completely cut. All the dimensions for these cutters, sources, etc. can be found in the video description. And here's the smaller cutter coming into play. So now we're ready to move on to the needlepoint work on the sides of the boxes. Okay, so I'm back. I've progressed forward a little bit on the side insofar as I've outlined and flooded the arch at the top of the box. I use purple on this one, very similar to that one, but again, you can adapt your box for any season or occasion by swapping out the colors. This is going to be the same color I'm going to use to ice the feet. I'm not going to focus on the outlining and flooding because it's pretty straightforward. I really want to focus this video on the needlepoint because it is a rather challenging and impressive looking technique. I will say it is time consuming. These elaborate panels, each of them, took me about an hour and a half to two hours to pipe. So if you want to simplify this box, I would say do less needlepoint on it. Don't do such a broad area or make a bigger grid. I have about 10 to 11 squares per inch on these grids, which is actually quite big for me. Usually I pipe about 15 squares per inch, but I wanted these to go a little bit faster than my norm, so I expanded the box size or the grid size, and that's another way to speed up this part of the process. Or you can simply do it on a small cookie and not do a big box. So the focus here is on the technique. Before we get to the needle point, however, though, the box sides do need to be prepped a little bit further, and ideally I should have done this before I ice the top. And by that prep, I mean I want to miter each of the corners, both sides on each side of the box. And by mitering, I want to file it to a 45 degree angle. You can see how it's kind of a 90 degree angle now. I want to take it down to a 45 degree angle on both sides. And that'll ensure a nice tight fit in the final assembly without a lot of gap to fill along the seam. So to do that, you can lay it on the edge of the table so it's overlapping, it's overhanging your surface and you can get your microplaner file underneath it and file like so. You know, alternatively, I'm just going to elevate mine on a piece of styrofoam and do the same thing. So I've got my blade of my microplaner angled at about a 45 degree angle. It doesn't have to be exactly 45 degrees. We're just trying to take off a little bit of the back side of the cookie so it fits better. And you can see that nicely from this angle. See how we've got a 45 degree angle there? As opposed to this side that I haven't mitered, which is still 90 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and miter up this side. I'm going to do it on all four box sides and then we'll start the needle point. This is a little more difficult to do once the needle point's on because I'm holding the cookie and you can easily break the needle point if you touch it. So we want to make sure we do this before it's iced. The first step with the needle point, now that everything's mitered, is to lay the grid. And then the second step will be laying in a looser icing to fill in the grid to create a pattern. So I'm going to focus on the grid first. Now I pipe all my lines with a parchment cone because I can get a very, 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 very fine line. I think this I'm probably piping with the, the equivalent tip would probably be a number zero or a double zero. Okay, we're ready to start piping the horizontal lines of the grid, and I'm using a relatively loose outlining consistency. I don't want it as thick as I normally outline because I, I want the icing not to break. If it's too thick, it'll be prone to breaking, and I'll have to pipe very, very slowly. But before I go any further with the horizontal lines, I do want to pipe some bounding lines up around the scallop shape. When the cookie breaks here, it's a little harder to stop and end lines without a boundary. So that's why I'm drawing this in. 
and then we'll resume the horizontal lines. To get a clean start on the line, I like to start piping off the cookie, as you just noticed. And I'm right-handed, so I'm always piping left to right. That way I have a clear view of the previous line and can use it as a visual gauge for spacing the next line. So again, starting off the cookie to get a clean start without a blob. You'll notice there's always a blob at the start. And I'll also extend it off the cookie to the other side, like so. Now, I'm trying to achieve a grid with about 10 to 11 squares per inch, or 11 or 12 lines per inch. So I'm just going to visually mark that off to make sure I'm on track before I get too far. I think the spacing is about right, but that will help guide me. And then continuing the process up the cookie. I don't want to pipe too many lines before I start cleaning up those trailing edges, however, because if the icing dries and then I then try to clean them up, I run the risk of breaking the lines I've piped across the entire cookie, and that is no fun to have to redo them. And to clean them up, I'll simply take my trussing needle and just break them while the icing is still wet into a nice straight line. That'll just make for a cleaner seam when we put the box together in the end. And same thing on the other side. So I'll stop every five or six lines and make sure I clean up properly. Now if you make a mistake at this stage of the process, it's relatively easy to clean up because we don't have any intersecting lines going in the other direction. So don't worry, you don't have to be too panicked about this process. And just to demonstrate that, I'm going to make a purposeful mistake here and break my line mid-process. And just to clean that up, I'm going to take my trussing needle and scrape it off. Because I'm working with white, it'll clean up without staining the cookie. And if you pipe too fast, sometimes you will get breaks. So I tend to pipe pretty slowly, but that's also the advantage of having a relatively loose outlining icing. You don't have to pipe quite as slowly as you would if the icing were thicker. So I'm working with an icing that maybe has one, one and a half teaspoons of water added to every cup of my icing glue as opposed to the normal three quarters teaspoon that I use for outlining icing. Now we'll just continue all the way to the top. So before the icing dries, you want to clean up any stray ends because if it dries, you run the risk of cracking the entire grid and we don't want to do that. I'm ready to start piping the vertical lines now and I will start in the center so that the grid is ultimately symmetric around center. And that first line is going to start slightly right of center so that the squares run dead center through the middle of the cookie. To make sure that first line is straight, I also like to mark off a visual guide at the base of the cookie before I start piping. That gives me a sense of where I need to make contact at the end and then start piping as before. Don't apply pressure until you start piping because that'll leave less of a blob at the start of the line. And then just let the icing fall, finally making contact at the end. Whoops, piped a little too fast and I got a break there, but this is a good learning point because I'm gonna show you how to remove this. It's a little trickier when you're over horizontal lines because there's a risk of breaking the lines underneath. So very gently slip your trussing needle in between the lines and lift off that icing while it's still wet. It's a little tedious, but you can do it. And I'm going to pipe a little bit more slowly and carefully next time and hopefully avoid any more breaks. 
just going to continue from here on out. I am going to turn it upside down and again pipe from left to right using that first line as a visual guide for the spacing of all of the rest. So I'll do one half of the cookie with the cookie upside down and then when I'm done with this side I'll flip it around and pipe the other half so that I'm always again piping left to right. If you're left-handed, then you're probably going to be piping in the other direction. You just want to have clear line of sight to the lines that you've piped so that you have a great visual guide. Okay, and remember, as with those horizontal lines, with the vertical lines, you also want to clean up the ends and any big blobs as you go. I'm just going to turn it around and get the bottom edge as well and straighten that out with my trussing needle. Again, I do this about every five or six lines. I don't want the icing to dry or it can break the entire line. So I'm going to finish this whole side following the same process. When I'm done with one side, I like to rotate the cookie and then start piping. And again, that just ensures that I'm always piping left to right and I can always see that line that I just piped because I'm using it as a visual guide to gauge the distance to the next line. So my grid on one side is all done. And as I said, for a grid of this size with about 10 to 11, actually 11 to 12 squares per inch, this took me about an hour to do. So to speed up the process, widen the grid, do a smaller area of it, or just do a small cookie, don't do a whole box. The technique is really the most important thing here. And don't worry if the grid's not perfect. I mean, I've got some wider spaces here and some smaller ones up towards here. By the time we fill it in to create the pattern, a lot of that's going to be disguised. Before I start doing that, I want to talk a little bit about different types of patterns. My purple box up here is a very geometric pattern where the pattern is largely laid on the diagonal. That's a relatively quick and easy pattern because I can lay dots one after the other into the openings without waiting. The dots are less likely to merge together because they're on the diagonal and I'm using a relatively loose icing so there is some possibility of dots merging. This pattern, to contrast that, it has some elements, the lines, that are laid on the diagonal so they go pretty fast but the iris or the, the flower in the center has lots of dots that go side by side. And in that case, there is more risk of my loose icing that I'm using to fill the grid bleeding into each other. So I will have to, for a pattern like that, I'd have to pipe every other dot when piping dots side by side, allow a little drying time, and then come back and fill the other dots. So that requires a little more precision, often a visual guide. In that case, I actually printed out a needlepoint pattern and followed it, just counted along until I got the final pattern. But um, I'm going to go with a really simple, straightforward diagonal grid, basically replicating that purple box on this one to give you a sense of how this works. So for filling the grid, I would like to use a slightly looser icing than what I used for the grid itself. This is nothing more than outlining flooding, sort of taken to the extreme. So I'm outlining with a thicker icing, flooding with a slightly flooding the tiny holes with a slightly looser icing. So it flows more gradually off the spoon. This is kind of a beadwork consistency. I'm looking for an icing that forms a nice round bead without a peak. I don't like the little peaks at the top. But one that isn't so loose that it settles into the hole and flattens out once it's in the hole. And the bigger the grid you have, the more likely the icing will flatten out if your icing is too loose. I like a little rounded bead that sort of sits, sits above the grid. So we'll test this out. Typically for my cup of glue, I'm adding oh, one and a half to two teaspoons of water to get it to this consistency. I'm going to start with a white and then I'm going to come back with two other colors. Again, I don't need a very, very open hole because I want to be very precise about where I put it. Now I'm just going to find my midpoint here, which is right here. This is why I was careful about placing placing a grid straight down the center and it's right here because I do want each of these boxes to be symmetrical. And I'm just going to go one after the other. Again, I'm piping on the diagonal and I'm not going to run the risk of the beads flowing into each other if I pipe one after the other. Whereas if I wanted to go 
directly across, I'd go one every other, and then come back and do the other openings. We're going to come back with another color. Okay, so I'm coming in with a third color. Of course, you could do two colors, one color, four or five colors. Really, the pattern complexity is up to you. This one uses two colors, white and tan. Again, I'm replicating this one and it's got three. I think a little bit of dark purple will just kind of give this an anchor color, if you will. So I'm going to put little dark purple dots in the middle of the squares I just piped and also create some diagonal lines with it. And then we'll finish out the top with some purple beadwork as well. Same consistency icing as I used before. I think I'm going to start with it, give a little more drying time to those squares because I have to get right in the middle. So I'm going to start with a diagonal line pretty much a dead center between these here. Create another little V. So I could add a few more dots down here, but I'm going to be putting feet down there, so I don't think that level of detail is necessary. I am going to come and open this up now that I've finished my tiny dots in the grid and just do a little beadwork along the upper border and the outer border. On this box, I also did some white beadwork more on the interior of the purple spot, but I'm just going to keep it simple for today. The process would be the same. You could jazz this up more or less depending on what you want your box to look like. So now that I'm done with the small dots, I'll just open this up a touch to do some slightly bigger dots along this edge and then along this inner edge, and then we'll be ready to put on our other embellishments. We're going to let that dry a little bit. We're going to come back and put a little fondant backing piece behind the window and also lay the roses and then we'll be ready to put the whole box together. Okay, so of course you're going to want to do all four box sides so they look as identical as possible because we want them to be fitting up really nicely at the seam so the pattern continues continuously around the box. I've got one done here, I've got three others off to the side. Before you move on to detailing the sides even further though, make sure you've also top coated and detailed your feet if you're going to be putting your box up on feet. Here I kept the details very, very simple, just lines and dots to mimic the lines and dots on here, but nothing very elaborate. I just want to pick up the same color that's at the top of the box on the feet and have that tie in in some way. So my choice here was to keep this purposely very simple. You want to do all four of those if you're going to be using them and make sure they're dry. Now you could leave this window open in the middle of the cookie, but since we're going to be filling it with other stuff, I didn't really want to see the cookies on the inside of the box that I'm going to fill it with poking out through the window. So I chose to back it with a little piece of fondant. You can also use white modeling chocolate, which is a little bit tastier. It just takes a little bit longer to set up. This is embossed fondant, meaning I simply rolled it over a textured mat. In this case, it's a sugar veil cake lace mat, usually used for making edible cake lace, but here I used it to press texture into a thin piece of fondant and let it dry until it was rigid and something I could pick up. 
And I'm just going to simply glue that with thick royalizing glue to the back of this window, taking care not to touch the dots I just piped because mine might still be slightly wet. And then we'll go forward with a pasting process, just attaching pre-made elements, roses and little bow loops. So now I'm ready to place my bows dead center with thick royalizing glue. I'm going to put a big rose in the center between them as well. And I'm using white icing glue so it if any peeks out, it's less likely to show, just like I did on the window. So I want to continue to add roses up along between the white and the purple to hide that seam, starting from bigger rose buds towards the center to smaller ones to the outside. Before I anchor them with royal icing, though, I am going to kind of visualize them on the cookie loosely without any icing. And once I'm satisfied with their placement, I can start gluing them down. I think that looks pretty good. Now we're just going to come in with some green icing thick green icing to create some leaves. Whenever I want to create texture with a piped effect, I use a thick icing so the icing holds its shape, and I tend to like to use tips for doing leaves. Here I'm working with a 349. You could also even go even smaller with a 348 because this is fairly delicate, but I'm going to try it with a 349 today. So that's pretty much it. I've got the last leaf on. You could add another little green leaf down here if you like. I'm just trying not to cover too much of the beautiful pattern that we already laid. And then you want to, of course, do that for the other three sides. Let them dry completely, ideally overnight, and then we're ready to move on to the next step, which is putting it all together in three dimensions. So while my purple box side that I just piped is drying completely, I'm going to switch to another box. Similar pattern, actually the exact same pattern, just different colors. So you can see what a very different look you get by just going with more neutral shades as opposed to some of the darker shades I used earlier. These were done earlier, they're completely dry, so they're safe to assemble at this point. I've got four of them that look like this. I've also got my four and three quarter inch base, and we're now going to begin the gluing process of just mounting them to the square. You want to make sure your square is completely square. I did file that as well. And the other thing I've done is I've marked, these are four and three quarter inches long, whereas this is four inches long. So I've got about an extra three quarters of an inch on this. And I want to make sure each side is centered on the side of the, the box base. And so I'm just marking three quarters divided by two is three eighths. So I'm marking three eighths inch marks on either side that'll help me center those when I, when I place them. Now with this particular box, I failed to miter the corners as you can see. So I may end up with bigger seams to fill at the end than I did with these boxes, but we'll see how it goes. My cookie is relatively thin, so hopefully that won't be, there won't be a huge glaring seam. Now I've got thick royal icing glue. I've matched it brown to match the brown of the gingerbread. If I were using a lighter cookie, I'd use a lighter color. And it's very, very thick because I want it to dry very, very fast. The thicker it is, the faster it dries. So I'm just applying some glue, I get my thick icing just to the bottom here to start and centering it between those guides. I want it pretty close to the edge. I just know this from experience that I can't have it much closer to the edge than that or all four sides won't fit. But you could also do a test placement of them and make sure that they're all going to fit given whatever distance you choose from the edge. So now that that's in place, more or less, you can see how wobbly it is. I need to take these props and I'm choosing ones that are tall enough that it can lean against the roses as opposed to against the needle point because we don't want to break the needle point. And I want one on the front and the back until this dries completely. And I've got to look at it from the side and make sure it's not leaning as well. It looks pretty vertical, but we're just going to we're going to put this middle, this prop in the middle and we're going to push this up a little more against the roses. And then from there, I want to make sure I get a lot of extra icing down at the base because I had very little as you saw on the bottom. So I'm just reinforcing the bottoms while it's open before I add the next side to get more icing along the corners. I want to do it on this side as well. And I'm not worried about how this looks inside. It's going to be messy. You can see I I've, I've did reinforce the back of this panel with some brown icing earlier to keep the cookie more rigid since the front isn't fully iced. And my, you can see some glue 
poking out from behind my window, but we're going to be filling this with a napkin, and so I'm not too worried about how neat that looks. I'm more concerned with how secure it is. Okay, so that's about as reinforced as I can get it at this point, and I think I am going to proceed to put the next side up. And again, we just want to mark out, if we haven't, mark out the rough center point here. So three-eighths here, and three-eighths here. Now here I want to make sure I've got plenty of glue up the seam. And this is where it helps to have mitered. I wouldn't have quite as big a seam. But hopefully we can cover that in the end without it looking too clunky. So now I want to come in and clean any extra out of this seam in the front of the brown because I've got to get a seam in there later and that might just interfere with the placement of that. And this is a pretty big gap for me. Usually I have a, a, a smaller distance between the two so I'm going to have to use a bigger tip to fill that in. Now I want to reinforce this seam. You can see there is air through it so the glue I had there isn't really making contact with the cookies on both sides. So I'm going to come back in with more icing. Before you put any more walls up, you want to make sure you're fully reinforced from the inside as well. So I lay more royal icing glue along the horizontal seams and also along the vertical seams, pressing it into the seams with a clean fingertip or a paintbrush, all the while keeping the props in place because this is still not completely dry. But it's important to get as much glue as possible on the inside so this is completely stable in the end result. Okay, so I've got two sides up and propped. I'm going to give it a little bit of drying time and then I'm going to come back when they're a little more stable, put on the other two sides just the same way. And then we'll be ready to finish out the seams, give it a little more drying time and then raise the box. So for this step in piping the side seams, I like to elevate the piece a bit so it's closer to eye level. This could even be higher for me. I'm going to have to scrunch down in order to kind of see what I'm doing, but that's okay. I also like to move the box very close to the edge so that as I come down to the bottom, my hand has somewhere to go. If, 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 if this is on the interior of the styrofoam, I'm going to start hitting the styrofoam before I can come smoothly to the bottom of the corner. I've got, I believe it's a number 27 star tip, which is a little bigger than the one I used here. I used a 24 or a 25 on those because, again, I mitered those corners and I had a smaller seam to fill. I think I'm going to need the slightly bigger tip to cover the entire seam. And what I'm trying to cover here is all the brown that's showing. Okay, all four seams are done the same way. I'm creating what I call a shell border with the star tip. So basically pushing forward with more pressure, pulling back and releasing pressure, pushing forward to create a bead, releasing pressure, pushing forward, pulling back and so forth. The key thing is to make sure you push enough forward to cover the gap between the two grids. You don't want to see any big holes of brown gingerbread dough without any grid showing through or it won't look like a continuously nicely fitted seam. At the bottom sometimes it's hard to release without getting a little icing on the base but that's okay. We'll just come in with a trussing needle and clean that off and tuck in that last little shell a bit. And now up at the top I do like to add a few leaves at the seam. This just creates more of a sense of the entire pattern continuing all the way around the box. Okay, so I've had my box now drying for about half an hour. Normally, I would let it dry overnight, or at least give it several hours of drying time before I attempted to lift it and put it on its riser, but since we're on video time, we're going to move a little bit forward today, and you're going to cross your fingers and wish me luck. I am going to elevate it. If you didn't want to elevate it, you could stop here. You could pipe a border at the bottom and stick some roses on the corners and not lift it and put any feet on it. Or you have the option of taking it up a notch, literally. Now, I showed you cookies. Cookies can be edible risers, but I decided to go with two cardboards glued together with royal icing as my riser because it was a little better height. It fit the feet that I'm going to put on it a little bit better. Now this riser, I want it big enough that it gives the box some support from underneath. It's about four by four. Recall the base is about four and three quarters by four and three quarters. I don't want it so big that it's visible once I put the box on it, 
but I don't want it so small that it really has no support underneath because it's going to be bearing the weight of something in it eventually. So I think that's good. Usually I give it a test lift, get it positioned, then put glue down, my royal icing glue, and then place the box there. But again, my icing, this was just put together. I'm not sure how secure it is, so I'm just going to tempt fate and try to get it all on there in a one pass. So I'm just putting a little of my brown glue on the base here, get my glasses on, and then I'm going to lift it. For lifting, it's good to get an edge with a spatula because your needle point now is so close to the sides of the box. You don't want to put your finger in it. And I'm going to kind of ease it off the other one, trying to keep it as straight as possible. And before I place it down, make sure it's centered. Might give it a light press in the center here. And that looks great. Now, so my feet, and I have two options here. I have this option here, which is lower. And I also have this one that's this other Franken cookie version, which I could use. It's a little bit, got a little more detail on it. It's got a little arc to it. It covers a little more of the pattern on the side. I think I'm going to stick with the flat ones that I have on the other boxes. But you'll notice there'll be a gap in the corner that I'm going to have to fill with a rose. So let's get those feet up. I'm just going to focus on two sides or one corner and show you that. You just replicate this exact same process on the other side. So I'm going to glue the feet up. And I like to apply, in this case, to the base of the box so I get the icing exactly where I need to stick the foot. And we could use a little bit more, I would imagine. And then I want to center it on that face. And remember, it's not going to run quite all the way across. We want to make sure also that it's standing straight up from this direction, you know, so it's not leaning in or out because then the, then the feet will look crooked when the box is finally together. And it, so it's, I want looking at it to make sure it's straight up and down this way as well. And then I'm going to put my other foot on this side just the same way. And I've got my feet kind of just resting on the surface. This piece obviously will have to be slid very carefully onto its final presentation plate so you don't knock the feet off. But that's generally not a problem. Okay, and so again, I'm looking at it from this side to make sure it's not leaning too far forward or back. Okay, I think that looks good. Again, I would go all the way around with the other two feet. But I'm just going to show you how to finish off the corner. And for that, I'm just going to fill it out with a fairly big rose just to fill that gap in some leaves. Now these roses, I have a whole other video about how to make them. The only thing I did to these, which started out pure white, is I dusted them with a little brown luster dust in the center to kind of age them or antique them, just to highlight some of the dimension in there. So something to that effect. So that looks good. So to glue the roses down, they're actually pretty heavy, so my green leaf icing was a little too loose to hold them in place, so I'm going to use some thicker white icing glue that'll keep them stable without sliding. And just gently push them into place so that they span, span the gap between the feet, basically. And then where there are little holes, I'm just going to come in with my leaf green and try to fill them out with greenery. So that one last leaf completes that corner rather nicely. So I just continue all the way around, put on the remaining two feet and roses at each of the three remaining corners, and she's all done. Just absolutely beautiful and very, very elaborate. Now, for presentation purposes, again, I'd let it dry. You can't let it dry too long. Let it dry overnight, and then to conceal all the stuff inside here, which isn't really attractive, you tuck a pretty little napkin in and then just fill it with whatever you like. I'm going to fill it with a few lightweight cookies. So I want to tuck that down a little bit because you don't want it interfering with the top edge of the box too much visually. 
And then once you're, you've got your napkin where you want it, then you can fill this with any treat of any kind. I prefer to use something relatively lightweight, other small cookies or candies to add another element of surprise. I'm going to wait to load mine completely since my box is still drying, but I think you get the idea. Now if you like this box video, the good news is I've got tons of other cookie box videos. So I encourage you to check out my cookie box playlist on YouTube. If you don't want to do something three-dimensional because it's just too time consuming, I understand that. This needlepoint pattern, this technique that I explored in great detail on this video looks fabulous on 2D flat cookies, so I encourage you to try that technique there. Till next video, live sweetly.